Stokes theorem together with the divergence theorem forms the capstone of any good calculus course that I'm aware of. Well, this presentation is going to talk about Stokes theorem as well as the curl operator which occurs in Stokes theorem. Uh, we will first talk about how people could have come up with the idea that there must be a theorem such as Stokes theorem. We'll then introduce the curl operator. Uh, and certainly we also want to know what the curl operator means, but that is best done after we have talked about Stokes theorem and after we have worked some examples that show how Stokes theorem is applied because then we can, as we familiarize ourselves with the operator, we can also repeatedly think of it in terms of the connection between surface and uh, line integrals that Stokes theorem presents. We will finish with a proof of Stokes theorem that will be a bit on the lengthy side, but um, that is something that I'll say a few words about when we get there. All right, so why would anybody think that something like Stokes theorem, which we're about to see, could be true? Well, here is a physical fact. If you're looking at a current in a wire that goes straight up, then this current I is actually surrounded by a circular magnetic field. That is something that can be measured. So currents are surrounded by circular magnetic fields. And the closed line integral of a magnetic field around the current that causes the magnetic field is not zero. So magnetic fields are not what we would call conservative vector fields. They have closed line integrals that can be non-zero. And uh, the stronger the current, the stronger the magnetic field and the larger the integral, which means there should be a connection between line integrals over closed curves, such as circles or rectangles, that include this wire and some field quantity that is enclosed by the curve. Because if I have a measurement of a line integral of a magnetic field out here, I will get a total uh, integral of zero because there is nothing going through a loop that would be out here. So there has to be a connection between something that sort of acts like the current only for a general vector field and the quantity that does that is the curl. Uh, and so for a vector field f equals pqr, we define the curl of f to be curl of f being Nabla operator cross f. So there is that Nabla operator from our discussion of the gradient again, which is ddx, ddy, ddz, a formal vector, uh, cross product with pqr. So this is a formal cross product, which then gives, well, dr dy minus dq dz right here. It gives us dr dx minus dp dz with an extra negative sign leading to dp dz minus dr dx in the y component and then dq dx minus dp dy for the z component. And the reason why this operator is the right operator to have, for example, in the context that I just mentioned of magnetic fields or, uh, surrounding currents in wires, that is what Stokes theorem tells us. And if you want to know why the curl operator looks the way it does, that is something that we're going to see comes out of the proof. My attitude towards that is, is uh, a little bit different from what other people are trying to do. When I look at this operator, I have no idea how that operator connects magnetic fields and currents. That is something that, at least for me, is very hard to see. Once I have Stokes' theorem, the theorem itself states the connection and the connection why the thing ar arises in the theorem then just comes out of the proof. So first of all, I, and then yeah, this is defined, of course, when all the partial derivatives exist. Now, first, as an example, can you compute the curl of a vector field? Of course you can, because all you have to do is you have to take the cross product of the Nabla operator, ddx, ddy, ddz, with the vector field. And so what you end up with is in the x component, you get 0 minus 0. In the y component, you get 0 minus zero with an extra negative sign, which still keeps it at zero. And in the z component, you get x, you get one minus negative one, which is two. So if you work it out, here it is first with the differential operators, and then the curl ultimately is zero, zero, two. And uh, remember that this 
vector field F is the prototypical vortex around the z-axis where you have that the strength of the vortex increases as you get away from the axis. So this is the kind of model that if you scale it right would uh, model the center of a hurricane, for example, where the velocities get faster as you get farther away from the center of rotation. Note, however, that it is not the magnetic field of an electric current because the magnetic field of an electric current has declining field strength as you get farther away from the wire. All right, now for Stokes' theorem, the first thing we need is a definition, and it is the definition of a positive orientation for the boundary of a surface. Um, so when you have an oriented surface with boundary parameterized by S of U and V, well, there are two ways to go around the boundary, and we need to assign one of them with one of the surface normal vectors and the other one with the other of the normal surface normal vector. And so if C of T is a parameterization of the boundary, then this parameterization is called positively oriented if and only if the direction in which the boundary is traversed by C of T can be obtained from the normal vector n of the surface. And remember that is SU cross SV or SV cross SU, given that the parameterization is in terms of U and V, via the usual right-hand rule, which means that if your thumb points in the direction of the normal vector, then the curvature of your hand gives the traversal direction of the boundary. That is, if your thumb points in the direction of the normal vector, then the curvature of your hand should tell you that here you're going around the boundary curve in this direction. If you look at it from above, then basically your normal vector points towards you and the traversal is in the mathematically positive direction, which is probably the reason why this is then called positively oriented. With that, we can now state Stokes' theorem, which is that if S is a piecewise smooth surface bounded by a simple closed piecewise smooth boundary curve, okay, so piecewise smooth just means we have enough differentiability conditions and all that. What we want to think about is a simple curve is one that doesn't intersect itself, and it is closed, which means that it really doesn't have open ends anywhere, which would be really hard to have open ends and still bound a surface with a curve that has open ends, right? Positive orientation just tells us how the uh, parameterization of the boundary curve relates to the normal vector of the surface. And let F be a vector field that has continuous partial derivatives in an open region of the three-dimensional space that contains the piecewise smooth surface. Then the line integral of the vector field along the closed boundary curve is equal to the surface integral of the curl of the vector field over the surface that is enclosed in some way by that boundary curve. So if we want to look at it this way, here is a vector field that apparently has some kind of a vortex, and that vector field, of course, sits in all of space here, maybe varies a little bit, but essentially does the same thing. And so then if we put a little closed curve inside this vector field, then I think we can all agree that if this vector field really is well behaved and does pretty much the same thing from here to here, that we get a positive line integral of this vector field along this curve. The curl, uh, for the curl we're now going to look at the surface that is bounded by the curve and the curl is somehow, and if you cannot see easily geometrically how the curl is computed from the vector field. I don't blame you, that is a complicated operator. But the curl is somehow related to the vector field and the curl goes in such a way that it actually permeates the vortices that the vector field gives us and that is something that we can also ultimately see from the theorem. And that then means that if we integrate the curl er over the surface that is bounded by the curve, we are supposed to get the same result. So if we look at this again from the point of view that we have the theorem, in this situation we must have that this line integral is positive, which means that the integral of this curl over this surface that is bounded by this boundary curve must be positive, and so with positive orientation the the surface must have an upward pointing normal vector and that means that the curl must be a vector field that is pointing upwards on this surface because otherwise 
this surface integral would not be positive like the line integral is. So this is a pretty good visualization of also how the vortices of a vector field are related to the resulting curl and of course the underlying all governing equation is Stokes theorem which says that the closed line integral of the vector field is equal to the surface integral of the curl of the vector field over the surface that is bounded by the curve. In terms of naming, Stokes apparently was more of a very very good intermediary for this theorem. The theorem was, uh, and I'm not a historian, but the latest that I've read uh, was that apparently uh, the theorem, the statement of the theorem was communicated to Stokes by Lord Kelvin who somehow found the idea for it and Stokes then presented this as an exercise to students and from what I recall Green may actually have been one of the people who first gave a correct proof of this result and for some reason unlike the cousin of this theorem which is the divergence theorem the uh, theorem did not get a neutral name such as the curl theorem but remained attached to the name Stokes. Um, either way that is traditional now and uh, we just move on with it and the main thing for us is certainly that we want to know how to use and understand Stokes theorem. So as an example let us integrate the vector field f of xyz being yz in the x component, xz in the y component and xy in the z component and we want to integrate this vector field around the positively oriented square with vertices 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 and 0, 1, 1 which is a square that sits at height z equals 1 in three-dimensional space but other than that it is a flat square. Well that would mean we would have to integrate a pretty nasty vector field along four line segments that would take a while so let's see what the curl gives us. We take the curl of yz, xz and xy which is that we take our nabla operator partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z and take the formal cross product of that with yz, xz and x y and so that gives us derivative with respect to y of x y minus derivative with respect to z of x z right here derivative with respect to x of x y minus derivative of y z with respect to z and then the extra negative sign from the cross product that we've seen often enough now and then the x derivative of x z minus the y derivative of y z and if you work that out you end up with y whoops, with, with x minus x, you end up with minus y minus y, and you end up with z minus z here, and that is a curl 0, 0, 0, and that means we can stop the problem right here. This integral is 0, and in fact the integral of this vector field is closed, uh, is 0 along any closed curve, which is nice, so sometimes you just lock out, you end up with, an in, with a vector field that has curl 0 and then by Stokes theorem that means that all the surface integrals of that curl of course are 0 and that means all the line integrals over closed surfaces of the uh, over line integrals over surfaces with boundary line integral over closed curves goodness gracious sorry about that so, so that all line integrals over closed curves of this vector field would be 0 this is uh, then also one of the prime ways in which people often hope to uh, take care of certain things uh, by just having things turn out simple and having zero curl. Um, we will have a presentation on the gradient, the divergence and the curl which are all operations with the Nabla operator uh, applied in all the sensible ways if you will in which such an operator can be um, applied and that presentation will elaborate some more on the relation between zero curl and uh, line integrals along closed curves being zero because basically zero curl is an indication under the right circumstances that you have locally if not even globally a gradient field. Okay that's this one so that's when that's what happens when we luck out of course it could also be that we have a vector field such as the vector field uh, f of xyz being z squared xy and we want to integrate that around the positively oriented boundary of the intersection of the plane x plus y plus 2z equals 4 with the first 
octant, and uh, that would mean, well, when a sloped plane intersects an octant, then the intersection is a triangle, so if we want to integrate along the boundary, we would need to integrate, uh, we would need to compute three line integrals, and so that could be rather complicated, so again, replacing those line integrals with a surface integral of a curl can certainly help a little bit. So let's compute the curl of z squared x and y. Well, that's going to be nabla cross z squared x y, which gives us derivative of y with respect to y, plus minus derivative of x with respect to z. We get the derivative of y with respect to x, minus the derivative of z with respect to z z squared with respect to z, and we've got the extra negative sign, right, from for the second component, and then we have the derivative of y with respect to x minus the derivative, whoops, the derivative of x with respect to x minus the derivative of z squared with respect to y, and that gives us 1, yeah, 1, then we have 2z and 1 again, and that is the curl of that vector field, and if we now want to integrate over that boundary, well, then we need the domain for the surface. And the domain for the surface, well, this thing can be written as z equals f of xy. So if we just write down the xy domain, we get the domain, and that would be that x goes from 0 to 4, and y then, since we're sitting looking at z equals 0 here, y can only go from 0 to 4 minus x. Uh, the surface and normal vector then are that the surface of x and y is x, y, and then here I solve for z, I get 4 minus x minus y divided by 2, which is 2 minus x plus y over 2, if you want to write it like that. And then for the normal vector, I need the x partial derivative of the parametrization, which is partial with respect to x of x, y, 2 minus x plus y over 2 and that gives us 1, 0, and a negative 1 half, right? And then I need the y partial, which is partial with respect to y of x, y, 2 minus x plus y over 2, which gives us 0, 1, and negative 1 half. And for the normal vector, I take the cross product of these partial derivatives, which is the cross product of 1, 0, negative 1 half, which is this vector here, with 0, 1, negative 1 half, which is this vector here. And that gives us, well, negative 1 half minus negative 1 half is 1 half. Negative 1 half minus 0 is negative 1 half. The extra negative sign gives us a 1 half in the second component. And we get 1 minus 0 being 1 in the third component. And that means that the line integral of the vector field along the curve is the same as the integral of the curl dot ds over the whole triangle, which is the integral over the triangle is integral from 0 to 4 in x, integral from 0 to 4 minus x in y, uh, where we then do the dot product with the surface normal vector. So this here then is our vectorial area element for the surface. That is our uh, ds, if you will. And the curl is the 1, 2z, and 1. And now this is fairly easily worked out. Of course, this is 1 half plus z plus 1 half, right? And here's where we have to be careful, because the z has to come out of the parametrization. And we can replace that either in the next line or right away, but be very careful here. Uh, let me make sure I flash this right, and of course I have to flash this by pushing the button. Um, this z here is foreign to this coordinate system because this coordinate system is in terms of x and y and what do we remember for the surface integral of a vector field we have to plug the parametrization in and the z component of the parametrization was z equals 2 minus x plus y over 2 or 2z being 4 minus x minus y and so that means that this integral actually should be 1 4 minus x minus y, 1, and 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, uh, 1 half, 1 half, 1 here, dy, dx. And uh, now we just work out this dot product. Well, still the same thing, 1 half plus 2 minus x halves minus y halves plus 1, right here. 
And if we add that up, we get 3 plus 1 half is 7 halves. So we get the integral of 7 halves minus x halves minus y halves. And the rest is, of course, just solving a pretty simple, though tedious, double integral. We have the integral from 0 to 4, integral from 0 to 4 minus x of what we had on the previous panel, which was 7 halves x ha minus x halves minus y halves. Well, the antiderivative with respect to y is 7 halves y minus xy halves minus y squared and y squared over 4, right? Which is exactly what we get here and y goes from 0 to 4 minus x. Well, we go ahead and plug y in and what do we get? We get 4 minus x times 7 halves which is 14 minus 7 halves x. Then we get x halves times 4 which is with a minus sign minus 2x and we have x halves times x times minus x, which is therefore minus x halves times minus x, which is plus x squared over 2. We have minus y squared over 4. Well, 4 minus x squared is 16 minus 8x plus x squared, the whole thing divided by 4, and we subtract 0, 0, 0. So that's not much of a contribution there and uh, f from the lower bound. And so now we add things up. We get 14 minus 4 is 10. Right here we have minus 7 halves x minus 2x minus negative 2x. So that remains at 7 halves x. And then we have x squared over 2 minus x squared over 4. That's just x squared over 4. Antiderivative of that should be 10x minus 7 fourths x squared plus x cubed over 12 right here, going from 0 to 4, which gives us 40 minus, uh, this should be 28, and then plus 16 thirds, right here. And so now 40 minus 28 is 12. 12 in thirds is 36 thirds, plus 16 thirds is 52 thirds. And that's it. And so that means we have a net vorticity of this vector field. This vector field actually net rotates around the positively oriented boundary of this thing. So it sort of rotates also around axes through this triangle that are uh, that those axes that are, are parallel to the Z axis. So this certainly is a vector field that has some kind of curl, some kind of vorticity. In terms of interpretation of the curl, well, what does the curl tell us? We know Stokes' theorem, and Stokes' theorem says that the closed line integral of a vector field along a closed curve is equal to the integral of the curl of the field over any surface that interpolates this closed curve. And so that means non-zero curl at a point means that there are some small closed paths near the point over which the line integral is not zero. You would just go ahead and uh, go perpendicular to the curl a little bit out and then look at some small small closed paths and because the curl will be pointing will, will be normal to a surface that is enclosed by these paths that we would have a net positive integral uh, for the integral of the curl over these tiny surfaces that are interpolating these closed paths and that means that the line integral the other side of Stokes' theorem is also not zero, and that means the curl is a measure of vorticity. So, for example, here, this vector field, I think we can all agree on, that is a vortex, and certainly if we integrate the curl of this field, which is 0, 0, 2 over a circle uh, or over a solid disk around the center here, we've got the curl just standing straight up. The normal vector of something that is flat would also stand straight up and so the integral over a disk here would be positive and that is very much in line with the fact that the integral along a, uh, a closed circle around the center would also be zero. So this is something uh, that is definitely a non-conservative vector field. Notice that actually the same thing also happens if I were to integrate say over a vertical line along the x-axis then a horizontal line along the y-axis and then a quarter circle or so because I would get a line integral 0, 0 and then here I would pick up some uh, contribution that is going to be positive and that's because the curl 
is non-zero throughout. So if I integrate over some region here, the integral of the curl over that region would also be non-zero, and that means we also get non-zero line integrals over paths that need not include the origin. So the upshot, the long and the short of it, really is that because of Stokes' theorem, because of something that ultimately is formally best justified with the proof, the curl measures vorticity. And that means if we're looking at a fluid flow, such as this one, which, which acts, of course, rather nicely here, we can see that neither here nor here do we have any kind of turbulence or vorticity, which means the curl of this vector field here as well as here would be zero, and that means that line integrals over closed curves in this vector field would be zero. Similarly, if we look at the electric field, the electric field does not have closed field lines. If I take the electrostatic field, it doesn't. And so if I take an integral over a closed path here, then I would get a line integral of zero, and that would work for any line integral, and therefore the curl of the electric field, the electrostatic field, it changes when you've got a time variable magnetic field in there, but in an electrostatic situation, the curl of the electric field is zero. And things are different for the magnetic field because the magnetic field has closed field lines, which means if I take a magnetic field and integrate it along a closed field line, I will definitely get a non-zero line integral. And that means the magnetic field has non-zero curl. And what the curl actually is then is again part of one of Maxwell's equations, which are fundamental to electrodynamics. Okay, so this is how the curl occurs in the various types of, magnet of, of um, physical fields that we've talked about. And the curl always in indicates closed field lines, vorticity, turbulence, if you will. That's the kind of thing that the curl can and does indicate. Which leaves us with the last part of this presentation, which is a proof of Stokes' theorem. If you look at the indicator in this file, it looks like this proof is very long, and in fact it is, and that's because I've, I've chosen to set up a proof here that even though it is computationally intensive, it is actually mathematically uh, very clean and, and, and correct. Um, and it is something where, uh, let's, let's be perfectly honest, um, even in a demanding course such as this one, proofs typically are not the main thrust, and that's also not going to change near the end of this course. However, as you continue in your mathematical or your scientific career, you will run into theoretical classes where, especially on, on the engineering and physics side of the house, you will have mathematical methods for physicists, for engineering, as well as classes about fields, for example, that actually get computationally very intensive, and these computations are ultimately, if not the same, then at least similar to proofs such as this one. So that's one reason why I want you to see this proof. The other is that actually this idea of triangulization, uh, triangulation, <laughs> words, goodness, um, triangulation is a fundamental technique for numerical analysis, and you're also going to see here this idea that that is somewhat pervasive, that there are quite a few things that if we can do them for triangles, we can do them in general. However, other than that, do not be intimidated by this proof. This is not something that now is going to become our daily bread. The uh, vector analysis with Stokes theorem, as well as with the divergence theorem, as well as with the presentations about interpretation of the operators that is still to come, uh, that's going to be challenging enough, and developing the physical intuition is important there also. This proof basically just tells us once and for all in a mathematically quite watertight way why the curl operator looks the way it does. Let's take a look at it. So the proof of Stokes' theorem is that in a first step we're going to prove the theorem for triangles, and we're going to piece everything else that we need together with triangles. So let's look at a general triangle. Well, a general triangle is starting at some point with position vector q, that's one of the vertices, and then you, if you go in a mathematically positive orientation, you first follow a vector a, 
then you follow a vector b and then you go back by following the vector negative a plus b. That's the way you get all the way around the triangle. Now notice that this picture is meant to be generic. This triangle looks like it is a right triangle and in fact as drawn it, it really is one but that does not need to be the case. And the picture is two-dimensional but this is something you can imagine that this can also sit in three dimensions and it will not change in its description because we're looking at a general a general vertex where we start and general traversal vectors for the sides as well as for the traversal back. So that means then also in terms of uh, proving Stokes theorem that there is a positive orientation with the normal vector a cross b because if a goes in this direction, b goes in that direction, then the normal vector a cross b points at us, which is exactly what it should do since we're traversing in the mathematically positive direction when we're looking at this triangle from the straight up above direction that we apparently have as our vantage point here. And then, well, then we can uh, encode, when, then we can parameterize the three sides. So the side h would be h of t being q plus t times a, where t goes from 0 to 1, that's where we go from t to uh, that's where we go from q to q plus a by just traveling along a being attached at q. Then that also means for the line integral, of course, we need to know what dh is, and dh is h prime of t dt, or dh dt is h prime of t, which is a, dot, a, a times dt, because if I take this and differentiate it with respect to t, I get a dt. Well, if we're looking at the other lines, the next line segment v here, then that has a parameterization v of t being q plus a plus t times b, because we're starting at q plus a, we end at q plus a plus b, and we go along a straight line that is parallel as a line segment to b, and so then, as we are accustomed for line segments, we start t at 0 and we end t at 1, where the vector that we have here is the beginning of the line segment and b is what we have to add to it to get to the end of the line segment. The dv that we need for the line integral will be v prime dt and that is just b times dt and that's because if you take this thing, this v, and differentiate it with respect to t, you just end up with the vector b, of course. And if we're looking at the third segment, this segment k here, that has a param parameterization k of t being q plus a plus b, because that's where we start, minus t times a plus b, because that is what we are traveling back to get back to q. t again uh, goes from 0 to 1, and dk then is, well, k prime of t dt, and k prime, if you differentiate all of this with respect to t, you just end up with negative a plus b, and then here we have the dt that is from here, of course. Okay, so that means that if we now integrate the vector field P00 along the boundary of the triangle T, and I just denote the boundary with delta T or del T, which is fairly common in mathematics, um, well, then I can certainly try to compute that, and that's going to be one of three terms that contribute to the total line integral of a general vector field PQR along this triangle. The other line integrals then will be the integral of q of 0, q0, and the line integral of 0, 0, r. And we're going to see that those can be computed very similarly, but if I am integrating the vector field p0,0 along the boundary of this triangle, then that'll be the integral of the, um, of the vector field p0,0 along the segment h, plus the integral of p0,0 along the segment v, plus the integral of p00 along the segment k, which, as we parameterize it, is the integral from 0 to 1 of p of the parameterization of the uh, segment h, which was q plus t times a, dot the dh, which we knew was a dt, so it's a1, a2, a3 dt, where the vector a is a1, a2, a3. Similarly, we get for the second integral that this is the integral from 0 to 1 of p, evaluated at the parameterization of v, which was q plus a plus t times b, and then the dv is b dt, and b is b1, b2, b3, and finally we uh, have the integral along the third segment k, where we 
have p evaluated at the parameterization. That was the one that was certainly a whole lot more laborious, right? And the uh, dk was negative a plus b dt, all right? The negative sign is here, and a plus b is a1 plus b1, a2 plus b2, a3 plus b3. And you can see why I wanted to work with p00 rather than with pqr. That is because that way we only have to worry about one of the components. We have a smaller expression that will still be nasty enough because what we get is, of course, integral from 0 to 1 of a1 times p of q plus ta dt. We get the integral from 0 to 1 of b1 times p of q plus a plus tb dt. And we get minus a1 plus b1 times p of q plus a plus b minus t times a plus b dt. And now we just have to continue working with this integral. Let's see, the first thing I did here is that I combined a few terms and I certainly jump a little bit. Um, let's first note that these two terms are the same as on the previous panel. That is something that is easily verified because that's exactly, uh, let me highlight this, that's exactly these two terms here. And what else do we have? I've got a minus t times a, I've got b minus t times b, so that's one, 1 minus t a and 1 minus t b. And that's exactly what we have here. Everything else is the same, I just have 1 minus t a plus 1 minus t b. All right, so that still stays the same in the first component, it stays the same in the second integral. In the third integral, I'm going to do a substitution u equals 1 minus t, and when I do that, the negative signs all cancel out in such a way that actually this integral becomes just still a1 plus b1, because that's just numbers, and all the parameterizations and the substitutions work out in such a way that that's actually the same as integral of p plus q plus ua plus ub dt, and because I ultimately want to du, uh, and because I want to ultimately combine these things, I've change things back around to dt. So this is a quick substitution here that you can work out for yourself uh, with paper and pencil if you wish. However, what we can see now is I can multiply out these parentheses and then combine integrals, which is exactly what happened here, because what do I have? I have an integral from 0 to 1, a1 pq plus ta. That's a1 pq plus ta minus a1 pq plus ta plus tb right here, and uh, that takes care of the first integral as well as of the a1 part of the third integral, and then I have plus b1 times p q plus a plus tb, that's b1 times p q plus a plus tb, so that takes care of the second integral, and then I have minus b1, so b1 and a minus sign with a p of q plus ta plus tb, and that's p of q plus ta plus tb right here. And I think now we just want to take a look at these integrals, and what we can see is that this first one here is actually, yeah, the first integrand is just the function p of q plus ta plus u times tb at u equals 0 and at u equals 1, because when u is equal to 0, this stuff is gone, and I get just p of q plus ta, which is right here, this stuff. And at u equals 1, well, then I get p of q plus ta plus tb, which is exactly what I have back here. So the, second integ the first integrand is this function of u at u equals 0 and at u equals 1. The second integrand is this function of u at u equals 0 and at u equals 1? Well, let's look at the easier part first. If u is equal to 0, this stuff is gone, and I end up with p of q plus a plus tb, and uh, that is right here, and when u is equal to 1, I end up with the whole thing. I end up with q in the argument plus uh, tb, which is what we have here, and for a, I get a plus ta minus a, and that's just ta here. So this is something where, again, we have an input function that is evaluated in two places, and that is something that, after you've done these kinds of proofs for a while, you realize that is something that triggers the memory of the fundamental theorem of calculus, 
And so the fundamental theorem of calculus says is that the difference of a function evalu evaluated at two bounds is the same as if you integrate the derivative with respect to that new variable from the lower bound to the upper bound. And note that the lower bound is actually u equals 1 because that's the part that is being subtracted in either case. So that means that this integral is actually a1 times integral from 0 to 1 for the dt that stays, but now the integral from 1 to 0 of the derivative with respect to u of p of q plus ta plus utb plus b1 integral 0 to 1 integral from 1 to 0 u derivative of that more complicated expression that we also had on the previous panel. Well now we can turn this integral around and get that this is minus the integral from 0 to 1 integral from 0 to 1 of still the same integrand minus b1 integral 0 to 1 integral 0 to 1 still of the same integrand here just so we have a double integral that we are familiar with and now not sure if yeah now we want to simplify this a little bit and we know that we can take the derivative of an expression such as this one with the chain rule and the derivative is going to be the gradient of p dot the derivative of the inside with respect to u which in this case would be tb and here the derivative would be the gradient of p dot the derivative of the inside with respect to u which is t minus 1 times a so this is now negative a1 integral 0 1 integral 0 1 gradient of p evaluated in the right place dot tb minus b1 integral 0 to 1 gradient of p at this more complicated object dot t minus 1 times a. Okay, so that has gotten quite complicated, but the other thing that we can see now is that uh, whenever we have a function that depends on two variables and spits out vectors, then that is basically the parametrization of a surface. And it turns out, what does this parametrization do? Well, this parametrization uh, starts at q and then t increases things in the a direction and the utb makes sure that we don't add too much in the b direction, but this parametrization sweeps out that solid triangle uh, over whose boundary we integrate here. And in similar fashion, even though the visualization is more complicated, this parametrization also parametrizes the solid triangle, which means we have an in here to turn this closed line integral now into integrals over that triangle that is bounded by these three pieces that we started with. In order to do that, we need to analyze these parametrization and parametrizations. And the first one was S1 of t and u being q plus ta plus utb. And if I take the derivative with respect to t of that, I get a plus ub, well it's the derivative with respect to t of q plus ta plus utb, derivative of q with respect to t is 0, the derivative of ta is a, the derivative of utb is ub, so I get a plus ub. The derivative of this parametrization with respect to u is the partial with respect to u of the same thing. The derivative of q will be 0, the derivative of ta will be 0 because they don't depend on u. The derivative of this guy here will be tb, and if I now take the cross product of these two partial derivatives, that'll be the cross product of a plus ub from here with tb from here. And uh, that is now something where b cross b of course is zero and we end up with t times a cross b as the uh, surface normal vector. Similarly, if I look at the second parametrization, which was q plus a plus tb plus u times t minus one uh, times a, if I take the partial with respect to t, I get the partial with respect to t of q is 0, of a is 0, of tb it's b, and of u t minus 1 a it's u a, so I end up with b plus u a. The partial of the second parametrization with respect to u is the u partial of q plus a plus tb plus u times t minus 1 a. This stuff does not depend on u, so that partial of that stuff is 0, and the partial with respect to u of this stuff here is just t minus 1a and that means the cross product of the partials which gives us the surface normal vector is b plus u times a cross t minus 1 times a 
a cross a is 0, so we end up with t minus 1 b cross a, which is the same as 1 minus t a cross b. I wanted to refer to a cross b in the same order either way. All right, so that means that our integral, which was negative a1 integral 0 to 1 integral 0 to 1 gradient of p dot t b d u d t minus b1 integral 0 to 1 integral 0 to 1 gradient of p uh, times t minus 1 a can actually be expanded and note that this t here is actually the t from the parametrization uh, from the surface normal vector for the parametrization that we have here and this t minus 1 is the 1 minus t that we had from the surface normal vector for this parametrization once we absorb the minus sign it works all the way so I just multiply top and bottom with a minus b norm that's all that happens here in the first one. In the second one I multiply top and bottom with a minus b norm and rather than having t minus 1 I take this negative sign, absorb it in here to get 1 minus t. Other than that, even though these expressions are huge and potentially intimidating, they, uh, they are still the same. But the advantage now is that I have that uh, this stuff back here excluding the b, this is the scalar surface element for a scalar surface integral over that triangle using this parametrization and this stuff here excluding the a is the scalar surface element for a scalar surface integral of the rest over this triangle that we had drawn at the beginning which means that overall this is now a1 over a cross b norm times the integral the double integral over the triangle of gradient p dot b which is exactly this part here a uh, scalar surface integral ds uh, as indicated here and then we have plus b1 over a cross b norm scalar surface integral over the triangle ds of p of gradient p dot a because let me see if i can pull that out yeah here is gradient p dot a with this big old ugly parametrization, which we now don't have to worry about too much anymore. And so now we can compute with this stuff a bit. And what do we get? Well, if we combine this stuff, I have the 1 over a cross b norm on the outside. And what do I have on the inside? I have b1 a minus a1 b dotted with the gradient of p. So that means as we go to the next panel, uh, we have the 1 over a cross b norm. We have the integral, the scalar surface integral over the triangle of the gradient of p dot b1a minus a1b. And this is now an expression that we can compute with. Even though it's going to be detailed, it's going to be potentially ugly, we can work out what that is. So we keep the 1 over a cross b norm, double integral over the triangle, gradient p dot. Well, if we look at the first component, the first component is b1a1 minus a1b1, so that is 0. Great. Second component is b1a2 minus a1b2 right here, and the third component is b1a3 minus a1b3. That starts looking like a cross product, and in fact that is what I want to have. I want this to ultimately turn into a cross product of a cross b. Let's see if we can finagle that. Well, the gradient of p is of course, derivative of p with respect to x, derivative of p with respect to y, derivative of p with respect to z, and that's what I've plugged in, but note that because this up here is zero anyway, it doesn't matter whether I call this up here the gradient of p or whether I call it zero, and so I just stuck a zero in here. That has the advantage that now I can replace this zero with something that will make this look a little bit more like a cross product, which is the next step. And a cross product, of course, cross multiplies first and second component, first and third component. What's missing is the cross multiplication of the second and third component. So that is what I stuck in here. So now this looks like a cross product, but the components are scrambled. Well, I can certainly unscramble that a bit. And the other thing that I've done here is that the component that goes with the first and second component in a cross product actually is a1b2 minus b1a2 
Well, I can reverse the negative sign at the cost of sticking a negative sign in here into the dp dy. Okay, so now I would have to resort that. And for a cross product, for a regular cross product, let's see. This would have to be the third component. This would have to be the second component. And that's right, because that's b1a3 minus a1b3. And this would have to be the first component. So that means that actually I can rewrite that as 1 over a cross b norm still, integral over the triangle 0 times the first component stays as is. This one here now is put into the second component, and this one here is put into the third component. And the whole thing, of course, has no impact on the result of this dot product, because if I resort the sum ends in a dot product, I still get the same result. But what I have here now, this thing, that is just a cross b, which means I can now pull things in and I have that this is the double integral over the triangle, the scalar double integral over this triangle, this parametric surface that gives us the triangle of the vector field 0 dp dz negative dp dy dot a b divided by a cross b divided by a cross b norm and that is the unit normal vector of this surface and we know the connection between the line in uh, the surface integral of a vector field and the scalar surface integral i may have said scalar line integral here i of course meant scalar surface integral the connection between the vector the surface integral of a vector field and the scalar surface integral is that you can get the integral of a vector field over the surface with a vector surface element ds if you simply integrate the vector field dot product with the unit normal vector of the, sur of the vector field, which is this in the scalar surface integral ds without the vector. And so that means that we have proved that the integral of the vector field p0,0 over the boundary of that triangle that we talk about is equal to the surface integral of the vector field 0 dp dz negative dp dy over the solid surface triangle. In similar fashion, I can do the same thing with 0 q0. And if you look back at the presentation, the only thing that changes in the whole really long and ugly early part that I have omitted here with three dots is that instead of a1 and b1, I would have a2 and b2 in the whole computation, and q instead of p, which gets us to exactly the same crucial point as what we had before, where it is that this integral is 1 over the norm of a cross b times the scalar surface integral of the gradient of q dot b2a minus a2b. And then the same kind of unscrambling of the components gives us that this integral is the integral over the surface of the triangle of negative dq dz 0 and dq dx. Go through that in detail if you wish. Similarly, for the vector field 0, 0, r, I end up with the line integral being the surface integral of dr dy minus dr dx and 0 over the triangle. And so that means that the integral over the boundary of the triangle of pqr dot dc is the integral of p0, 0, 0 plus the integral of 0, q0 0 plus the integral of 0, 0, r, which is the integral over the solid triangle of 0 dp dz negative dp dy plus the integral of negative dq dz 0 and dq dx plus the integral of dr dy minus dr dx and 0 which is the integral of dr dy minus dq dz uh, in the first component dp dz minus dr dx in the second component and dq dx minus dp dy in the third component and if you compare this with what you get when you just take nabla cross pqr, then you realize that this is the curl. So that proves that, that for triangles, the integral of a vector field is along the boundary of a triangle is in fact equal to the integral of the curl over the solid triangle as a surface integral. Okay, and if we now continue, we now go to the part, the geometric part that we don't have all the machinery to fill in. This is something that I've also said in the presentation on 
integration. The full theoretical details of integration theory are surprisingly subtle, and so we are going to gloss over those things. But uh, from animations that we've seen, for example, for arc length and for line integrals, it should be pretty uh, acceptable that every smooth curve can be approximated by a polygon, and it should also be pretty acceptable that every smooth surface can be approximated by a union of triangles. And so what would that look like? Well, here's a smooth curve. If I now take this curve C and put a bunch of partition points on this curve, and if I then connect these curves with straight lines, I get a polygon, and I think we can already see here that this polygon is pretty close to the curve, and then in a line integral over this closed polygon is going to be pretty close to the line integral over the closed curve. And so that means that we should be able to approximate arbitrary line integrals with integrals over polygons. And how about the surface integrals? Well, now I can take this surface and put base points inside that surface. And if I then make all the sensible connections that I can make without crossing any of the connections with each other, then I obtain what people call a triangulation of this surface. And again, we can certainly accept that if we make this triangulation sufficiently fine, then the triangulation is virtually indistinguishable from the surface. Certainly this is a two-dimensional picture, but you can imagine the same thing working in 3D. If you look at any of the graphs of surfaces that we had in this course so far, they typically had this approximate rectangle coordinate grid on the surfaces. If you take every one of these approximate rectangles and cut them in halves by going, putting a diagonal in, you essentially have a triangulation. And so that means arbitrary surfaces can be approximated by these triangulations. And then it also makes sense that the surface integral should be closely approximated by the sum of the surface integrals over these little triangles. Okay, what do we know therefore? We know that for every one of these little triangles, Stokes' theorem holds. We just have proved that. So the integral of a vector field, if I go along here, here, and back, is this, this line integral, if I go here, along here, and back, that line integral over this closed curve is the same as the integral of the curl over the surface of this triangle. That works for all of these triangles, which means now that the sum of the surface areas over these triangles of the curl is approximately the surface integral of the curl over the whole surface that we were approximating here. And the sum of these surface integrals of the triangles is equal of the curl of the surface. The sum of the surface integrals of the curl over all these triangles is the same as the sum of the line integrals over the closed boundaries of the original vector field. And that's where it, of course, looks as if we're counting a bunch of stuff on the inside, not just the outside. But for every one of these triangles, if I take, say, this triangle and that triangle, I traverse this boundary once in the forward direction, going left to right, because I want to be mathematically positive on this triangle. But if I'm mathematically positive on this triangle, I traverse the triangle in the right to traverse this side in the right to left direction. So you can convince yourself by looking at everything in here that every internal curve is actually once traversed forwards and once traversed backwards, which means that the line integrals of those vector of the original vector field along the inside connections cancel each other out, which means that the sum of the integrals over these of the sum of the integrals of the curl over the solid triangles is equal to the sum of the line integrals of the original field along the boundary. And then in the limit, if we make this triangulation infinitesimally, infinitesimally fine, we get that the line integral along this red boundary curve is the same as the surface integral of the curl over uh, the surface that is interpolated here. And so that is that. Now that proof was really hard. Now there's a quick note here just for those who really want to appreciate the abstract stuff, and that is the proof of Stokes' theorem that we've done for the triangle would be a whole lot simpler if we, had, if we used squares parallel to the axes. But it turns out that that is not good enough because 
For example, in the animation that we're just going to see, the length of the diagonal is um, is square root of 2. Well, let's just look at that. If I have a square of side length 1 and 1 here, then of course this red line by Pythagoras has side length square root of 1 plus 1, which is square root of 2. But the blue polygon that we're using to approximate has length 1 independent of how many stairs we insert, right? Because I have to go over and up, and all the ones that go over add up to 1, and all the ones that go up also add up to 1. So this is now a very fine technical point that essentially tells us that we cannot, even though triangles are a little bit less convenient computationally than rectangles, we cannot avoid triangles, which means this big old ugly proof that I just sort of forced you through really is the best we can do if we want to have something that is as watertight as possible. There are other arguments that can be given that are close to that, but I, th I think they have a little bit more hand-waving to them and they don't use triangulations, which is unfortunate because if you are ever in the situation that you need heavy numerics, you're going to find that triangulations and other kinds of ways to cut things up into objects that behave well theoretically and numerically uh, will arise and those things will not be rectangles and triangles with sides uh, that are parallel to the coordinate axes. All right, with that, well, you may have a headache right now because this certainly was demanding. If that is the case, take a break, get over what you have there and then get going with the computations. They will be challenging enough certainly and certainly whenever you have worked something with Stokes theorem think about what it tells you, think about what that tells you about vorticity of the field under investigation. Ideally you may even have some problems where you actually talk about stuff that occurs in nature such as a fluid flow, a magnetic field or an electric field where you can really make the connection that you will ultimately need to the actual applications that exist. I'm going to take a break now too. I think we both have deserved one. I'll see you later.